What's up guys? I just want to welcome y'all to my first video on this page. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to see where God takes this. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not used to preaching to a camera. I'm used to, to preaching at least in front of a few people or speaking in front of a few people. So so a little nervous about this. It's, it's a little different, but we're just going to go with it. We're going to have fun and, and we're going to get into what, what God wants to talk about. Um, today I'm going to talk about I'm going to start in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to go through verses 1 through 11. That's going to be the basis for what we're going to speak about today. Um, and we're just going to jump right in. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock back to the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression to which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children, out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Sorry. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children out of Egypt? What I want to focus on today is, is that question that Moses asked God. Who am I? Who am I that I should do the thing that you've called me to do, the thing that you, God, have asked me to do? I know personally, I ask myself that question all the time, even in when I felt called into doing this channel, it was like, God, who am I? Like, who am I? Why? Why me? You know, and, and I know there are people out there that have asked yourself the same thing, that God has called you into something. He's, he's leading you into something. And you ask, who am I? Now, to better understand this text that we just went through, I want to take a minute and break it down just a little bit. And I want to start with Moses. And get a better understanding of why he would ask God that question. Moses was a conflicted man. Um, he was born into one cult, born into one culture. Um, he was born a Hebrew slave. He was raised in a second culture, um, adopted by an Egyptian princess, adopted into that family, and now living in a third culture. And he's out in this in this barren land, um, basically leading sheep. Moses was the second born in his family, and in biblical times, that's real significant because the firstborn back then was the one that basically got all the glory. They were they were the heir to, to the family. They were the one with the birthright. The second one was basically just out of luck unless something happened to the first one. Um, and even, even in his adoptive family, um, his adopted Egyptian family, he wasn't the first, and so he wasn't the heir to Pharaoh. So he was always second. He always came second, always kind of like a second-class citizen. Then at one point, um, Moses saw that there was a slave being messed with by these Egyptians being beat. And in his attempt to, to help the man, Moses murdered one of the Egyptians and, and tried to cover it up. So, so Moses came with some baggage. Moses has some history, and, and I, we could really spend all day getting into the life of Moses and, and talking about all the baggage in his life. There, there's a lot more that could be talked about, but, but that gives you a better understanding of why Moses did not feel qualified to answer the call of God. Second, let's talk about the location and where, where Moses was when God called him. He was on a mountain called Mount Horeb, which in Hebrew means wasteland, desolate and dry. Uh, very significant when you think about Moses and where he's probably at spiritually at this point in his life. He's he's probably feeling really dry, really desolate. Um, later, that location will be known as the mountain of God. I think it actually even referred to it at one point in that text. 
Then I want to talk about, just break down real quickly, the calling, God calling Moses. When God called Moses, he called his name twice. Now, I've read this story so many times and I just glossed right over that. Didn't really see any significance in it. But as I was studying to, to prepare this, I kind of kind of found out and, and uncovered that that there's a lot of significance in the way the way God called Moses. So so he called him twice. He said, Moses, Moses. And I found out that only seven times in scripture does God ever call a person's name two times in a row. And if you know anything about God, everything God does is deliberate. There, there's no coincidences with God. Everything is intentional. And so only seven times did God ever call a person's name twice in a row when calling that person. And each time, right before that person, right before that person receives a great revelation, he gets a spiritual awakening or, or this great transformation. Something big happens. If God called their name twice, something big happened in that person's life. Um, the most notable in my mind, just, just right off the top of my head that comes to my mind is, is Acts chapter 9, I believe it's verse 4. When, when Jesus appeared before Saul, he was Saul at the time, later became Paul, but he, he approached him on his way to Damascus and was like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And if you know that story, you know that was when his great transformation came. So, so him calling his name twice was, was kind of a big deal. And then the last thing, what God used to get Moses' attention, he used a thorn bush, which, you know, again, you know, as a kid in Sunday school, when they teach this, you just kind of go right, oh, he used a thorn bush and it burned and it didn't burn up. And that's great. That's cool. But again, it's significant because if you think of a, a thorn bush, it's just this fruitless, dry place of pain. Like you don't, there's really no use for it. It's, it's kind of useless. You're not going to stick your hand in it. You know, there, there's nothing you're going to do. You're not going to pick it and use it. Like it's just, it's just there and it's just, it's just painful. And it's, it's a reflection of not just where Moses was, but his, his life physically, mentally, and spiritually at this point. I mean, Moses was, was just fruitless and dry. He was, you know, under a lot of, of mental and spiritual pain. I mean, he just, he just wasn't, when you think of Moses and you think of this great biblical hero, that's not who he was at this point. So you may be asking, well, why is that significant? Why, why does all that matter? And again, you have to understand that everything God does is intentional. There is no coincidence when it comes to God. If God does it, there's a purpose behind it. Everything from the person to the place to the instrument that God used was all by design. And so despite where you come from, despite anything that you've done, God wants you to know in this that he will meet you in your fruitlessness. He will meet you in your dry place. He'll meet you in your pain and he will call you out from that place. God's not going to wait on you to get to a better place to decide, hey, now I'm going to call you. Hey, now I want you. God's going to use you in that place. And I relate so much to this story with Moses because, like I said a while ago, I find myself asking God all the time, who am I? Who am I to speak? Who am I to preach? Who am I to lead anybody or to do anything? And, and again, I'm sure there, there are some of you that, that may be in that same place. You know, we live in a world that, that wants to define us by our, our darkest moments or, or by our, our greatest failures. Um, we live in what I call a once always society. You know, once you've done it, you'll always do it. Um, once you're an addict, you're always an addict. You know, have you have you ever met someone that was going through recovery and they're they're they struggle through it, and a lot of it is because nobody believes in them because people just think, well, once you've done that, you're always going to do it. You're never going to be better. You know, once a cheater, always a cheater. I've heard that a million times. I've heard that my whole life. Uh, once somebody cheats, they'll always cheat. You know, once a fill in the blank, always a fill in the blank. You can use just about anything. Uh, society says if you've done it once, you'll do it again. And they place this label on you and you struggle to shape, escape from these shackles of this social and emotional prison. 
And any time that you think that you want better for yourself, they tell you, they give you a million reasons why you can't do better. You know, whether it is the, oh, well, you, you've always been that way. That's how you're always going to be. Or, or they'll make up stuff like, oh, well, you're too old to change now. Or, or you're too young to get into that and, and to make any difference there. Or you'll never be able to be anything because of where you come from. Or how can you talk about a future with a past like yours? And the worst part of it is that, man, it, it comes so much from the church as well. And I'm not, I'm not here to dog church. Church is important. It's a big deal. But some of the worst things I've heard about other people, including myself, came from church people. Um, I've, I've actually preached at a church and God has moved and the altar has been full. And at the end of the service, hear whispers of people saying, I can't believe they let him preach. And that stuff hurts like that that's some serious hurt there's no hurt like church hurt there's there's no hurt like the hurt that comes from the people who stand and they talk about grace and forgiveness and mercy but then the second someone messes up or someone comes in with their baggage they say oh no no they i know about that person i know about them so but understand that not everybody's like that um not every church is like that we're all just people and we all make mistakes. But but I do understand that hurt. And the only way to get over that and to rise above that hurt, whether it came from people in church or out of church, is to learn who I really am. And me personally, I'm still learning. Um, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm really just now getting to a place in my life where I realize the value of knowing who I am. So one of my greatest biblical inspirations is Saul, Paul. Um, Paul was a very religious man, um, Pharisee. He was basically like a Bible scholar. Like if it was, if it had to do with religion, he knew it. He was like a religious genius, very religious man. But he, he was persecuting and killing and imprisoning Christians. Um, and so that, that's what he was actually going to do on the road to Damascus when Jesus called him out and and, and asked him, you know, hey, why, why are you persecuting me? And, and called him to do his work. And that's when that's when he had that change and, and the transformation of Saul to Paul came about. But um, what he did was he, he sent him to this place and he blinded him. He had blinded him and sent him to this place. And, and in Acts chapter nine, um, I'm going to read this and it'll help kind of explain the story real quick. But it says that there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said to him, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call your name. So the word was already out about him. Everybody knew about him. And, and when the Lord spoke to Ananias and said, hey, man, I need you to go. You need to meet this man, put hands on him so that he can see again because I blinded him. Even though the Lord himself spoke to Ananias, Ananias still doubted him. Ananias still questioned God about him because of his past. But in verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And verse 21 goes on to say how everyone was baffled and questioned Saul. Nobody believed that he was different. Nobody thought he could be a changed man. But in verse 22, it says, But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. See, here's the thing. Whatever sin you have in your life, whatever whatever you've done, it precedes you. It goes before you. Um, and when you when you try to live better, when you try to do better, there's always going to be people that say, no, I've heard about him. No, I've heard about her. I know how she used to be. I don't trust her. I don't trust him. Um, it, it's going to happen even, even when God himself, you can see in this, even when God himself tells them, hey, that's my one. I chose them. You need to use them. There's going to be people that's going to question it. But you, you got to develop this mentality. See, see, Saul and Paul, 
Paul, I'm going to call him Paul, even though he was Saul in the beginning, because that's how I refer to him, that's how I know him as. So Paul wasn't worried about the voice of the people. He was focused on the voice of God. And when you have a real encounter with God, his voice takes priority and it doesn't matter what anybody else says. So what I have to say is, is when, when I worry about what people are going to say if I preach, what are people going to say if I, if I post something about God, is I have to say, you know what? Such and such assembly of God didn't call me to preach. Such and such assembly of God or such and such Baptist church didn't call me into the ministry. I was called by God. And so I've got to get to a place where I say, if you got a problem with that, if you don't like God calling me despite my past, take it up with him. You know, Romans 8, 33 says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So to paraphrase that is, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If God called you, God has justified you. And when God justifies you, it's not saying that what you did wrong was okay. When God said he justifies Saul or Paul, he's not saying that, oh, what he did was right, what he did was okay. It's not, it's not condoning a person's actions, but what it is saying is he is mine and I chose him. And so God is telling somebody today, you're mine, I chose you. Don't listen to the voice of the other people. Don't listen to what they say. If I called you to it, I'm going to bring you through it. Don't worry about what they said. God wants to justify some people out there watching this, but some of y'all have been listening to the voices way too long. Some of y'all are like me and you're worried about what people's going to say. You're worried about what people's going to think. You got to let go of the gossip. Um, don't be afraid of what people say or think if you step into God's calling, God is calling you out. Just as he met Paul or saw in that moment, in his worst, God's doing the same with you. Just like he met Moses in his driest place, in his most fruitless place, in his painful place, God's wanting to meet you there too. Stop listening to the world around you and hear God call your name. You can't hide in fear and still experience the fullness of God. So if you're out there like me and you're struggling to, to really know who you are and to really grasp who you are, let me share with you what the Bible says in that regard. This is very important. You are a child of God. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So whether you attend church every time the doors open, whether you never grace a pew a day in your life, you are God's child. He created you. He designed you. He knows everything there is to know about you. Every thought, feeling, emotion, action, he knows it already. And despite what you said or done, you are loved. This is probably the world's biggest means of attack. If you turn on the TV, you see the news, um, they're always pushing this love is love, love is this, love is that. The world has twisted and distorted and perverted what love really is. You know, the world says love is sex and love is telling me all the things I want to hear and doing the things I want you to do. And love is making me happy. If you don't make me happy, you don't love me. That is wrong. Um, the world says that if God really loved you, he wouldn't you wouldn't go through that. You wouldn't suffer. You wouldn't you wouldn't go through tough times. And that, and that is wrong. That is wrong. God's love is summarized in one simple verse. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now that is love right there. While we were still sinners, while we were in our worst spot, while we were doing everything that goes against him, he chose to die for us. That's love. Not because we were deserving or worthy or that we will ever be deserving or worthy. Not because he expects perfection from us or... Not because he didn't know the lifestyle that we would choose. God knew. He died knowing that you you or me or anybody would have struggles. He knew that there would be drug and alcohol struggles. He knew there would be a struggle with sexual sin. He knew there would be struggles with depression, suicidal thoughts. He knew that there would be times in our life we would turn our back on him. But he loves you so much that he died knowing that we would choose sin. And through his death, he offered us a way out. Ephesians 1, 7 says that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of grace. Redemption. That means the act of regaining 
or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. So his debt, his death cleared our sin debt. So that means it doesn't matter how bad the sin was. It doesn't matter how much of the sin it was. It doesn't matter how far away we ever wandered away from them. It doesn't matter how long we lived in sin. It doesn't matter how great our debt is, is paid for. He paid for it. Um, to put that into perspective, imagine finding out that someone wrote a check that would clear all your financial debts. Every debt, your car, your house, credit cards, student loans, whatever debt you have, Imagine that someone wrote a check that would clear all that debt out. All you had to do was go claim it. Would you take it? I don't know anybody that wouldn't. God wrote the check that cleared our sin debt. All you got to do is take it. And then you have to understand that while you're a child, child of God, while you're loved, while you're redeemed, you are also called. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God spoke this to Jeremiah and the same is true for you. Before you were ever formed, before you were ever conceived, God knew your name, your personality, your strengths, weaknesses. Um, he knew your needs. He knew your struggles. He knew your successes. He knew all your failures. He, he already knew it and he still chose you. Knowing all these things, he still justified you. He still sanctified you. He still ordained you. And he placed you in this time, place, and generation for a purpose. The question is, will you accept it? The world says, God won't use you. You've done too much. Your past is too much. But the word says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what your struggle is today, but I know there are people out there that that feel the same way that I feel at times. And I know that someone somewhere out there is, is struggling with some of the same thoughts and you, you've been through it. You know, life is life is just really taking its toll on you and you feel defeated and you feel worthless and alone and you struggle to see your value, not just in God and with being used by God, but just in life in general. And I want to I wanna give you this example, and I want you to picture $200 bills. One of them, brand new, crisp, perfect. The other one, wrinkled, dirty, maybe even ripped a little bit. But I'm saying to you, I'm going to give you $100. Is it going to matter to you which $100 bill you get? Are you going to be picky about whether it's the, the new one or the old one, the, the clean one or the dirty one, the, the crisp one or the wrinkled one, like at the end of the day, you're not going to care because a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars. And that's the same, that's the same mindset you got to have about yourself. Life may have you worn and scarred and dirty and broken, but you still hold that same value in God's eyes. You, you haven't lost any value and you need to have that value in yourself as well. And I'll end it with this. God knows who we are even when we don't. Even when we're trying to find our place and find our way and find out who we are, God knows who we are. And God knows who he is. And that's what's important. God knows who he is. And in order for us to really know ourselves, we have to know him. So the more I want to know about me and who I am, the more I need to know him because God is the one that's going to show me who I really am. So I encourage you today to seek God. Learn who you are in him and go be everything you're called to be because somebody out there needs you. Somebody out there is waiting on you. You've got the word for somebody. You've What you've been through, the things you've dealt with in life and what God wants to bring you through, somebody's waiting to hear that. That You're, you're somebody's lifeline out there today and I just want you to grab a hold of that and, and, and take it and run with it, man. Um. Thank you again for for sitting through this video. Um, I hope that I hope that it that it touched somebody out there. Um, if you could, if you're if you're on the YouTube channel, if you could just subscribe. Um, if you're on Facebook, like it, share it. You know somebody out there may need to hear it. Um, 
Also, I'm going to put the, the email address on here. So if you need prayer or you want to have something you want to talk about, you need to share something, you can you can email me. Um, if you need prayer, you don't have to tell me what's going on. It's none of my business. Just say, hey, man, going through some stuff. need you to pray. Um, if you want to share, you can share. You know, it, it's between you and me and God. But but if you don't want to share, that's cool. Just, just say, hey, man, I need prayer. I'm not, I'm not going to ask any questions. Um, but uh, thanks again, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry if I hand talk too much. I'm, I'm a preacher, so you know what I'm saying? Preachers talk with their hands. My wife told me, get control of your hands when you speak. But I feel like I probably use them a lot. She'll just have to get over it. But uh, anyway, God bless you guys. Go out and be blessed. And I'll see you next week. Hey guys, real quick, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for, for being a part of this channel and a part of this ministry. Um, if you'd like to support the ministry, you do have that opportunity. Uh, one simple way and most important way is praying. Prayer for the ministry is great. Um, subscribing to the channel, uh, that helps. Liking and sharing the videos, that helps. But also, um, as with anything in live, nothing, nothing is free. Everything comes at a cost. And so I, we do have some costs with running this thing. Um, just a little way to raise some money as we are selling shirts. Got these right here. Um, if you're interested, I uh, got the email address on here. So just, just email me uh, and I can get you all the information you need about that. Got a couple of different designs, got some new ones coming out. So if you want to support the ministry in any way, uh, you're more than welcome to, but don't feel obligated. Again, most important thing you can do is pray. So uh, thank you for all your support and we'll see you next week.